Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Turning Towards Life. This is Lizzie and Justin from Third Space. And here we are again, entering into this beautiful, sweet space of wondering what's going to happen next from our conversations and our wonderings and our musings about life. Again, I have to say, Justin's brought the most extraordinary source for us. And I'm so delighted, Justin, to be here and to feel into this with you, this particular loveliness of George Saunders. And I just want to say a big welcome to everybody. Maybe you're a new person joining us. Maybe you've been listening to us walking your dog around the lake for ages. Maybe you're in hospital for some reason and you're listening to us to help you get to sleep. Goodness knows we've had so many different bits of feedback, haven't we, Justin, about why people listen and how people listen and what it brings to them. And um, we know that people listen in all kinds of different circumstances. And we're so grateful that we can be with you in all those different moments of your life. So thank you for being here and thank you for um, being along the journey with us in however short or long form, in whatever way you listen, whether it's a podcast or on our website or through here uh, live on Facebook as well. We're really grateful that you're here and I'm really grateful to be here, Justin, as well. Mm. Me too. I was, we were just talking, as you, you know, of course, before we began this morning and I was saying how, um, I suppose inevitably, maybe for many of us, this <clears throat> November Sunday in 2022, when we keep on being brought so much of, that's going in, on in the world that's difficult and um, seems to me such a, an important reminder in the midst of whatever is happening that one of the things that we humans can always do is be together. But there's really good reasons for hopefulness not not of the scale of um we can change all the things that are hard that we have to face collectively in the world but that in the midst of it there are really genuine choices about how to be with one another so i'm really glad you know to be engaged in a conversation which is also a practice in being together in a in a hopeful way in in a way that um meets and appreciates what the gift of being a human and being alive and bringing our intelligence and wisdom and good heart and presence to one another and so uh hence this source um which i've brought for this week which uh is from george saunders uh, wonderful wonderful book a swim in the pond in the rain which i very highly recommend and i brought this lizzie partly because it's about what we're doing so that's part one of the reasons to bring it. But also, I think it's about how any of us might choose to be in the world with one another in a way that brings our aliveness and the wonder of being with one another together forward. And it's also in thinking about all of our, we don't talk about this so often, but of course, turning towards life is born out of third space. And one of the things that third space is up to is the work of uh, a very deep kind of responsive coaching and then teaching it to other people. And I'm thinking about all of the people who are journeying with us, who are learning to be that way and work with that way with one another and how this is about that too. So I'm hoping that this might also make its way into the, the community of people who study on our professional coaching course and meet all of them, meet all of you in some way. So here's the source. It's in our Facebook group. It's in the notes for the podcast. It's with the videos on YouTube. It's all the sources are on our Turning Towards Stock Life website, um, where, by the way, you can, for all of you who are with us, you can uh, get this sent to you by email and you can also find out ways to email us, which is, uh, we so love hearing from you. So I'll read it. One of the main symptoms of a bad conversation is this, one of the participants is on autopilot. Imagine you're on a date, feeling insecure, <clears throat> you've brought along a set of index cards. You know, 7 p.m., inquire RE childhood memories. 7.15 p.m., praise her outfit. We really want the date to go well, but every time we glance down at our index, index cards, this is felt by our date as disengagement, and she's right. We're leaving her out of the process. Our anxiety has made us crave a method, 
when what the situation demanded was some moment to moment responsiveness to what was actually happening to the true energy of the conversation. We prepare those cards and we bring them along and we keep awkwardly consulting them when we should be looking deeply into our date's eyes because we don't believe that devoid of a plan, we have enough to offer. Some conversations feel evasive, ill-considered, agenda-laced, selfish. Others feel intense, urgent, generous, truthful. What's the difference? Well, I'd say it's presence. Are we there or not? Is the person across the table there to us? or not. One of the main symptoms of a bad conversation is this. One of the participants is on autopilot. Imagine you're on a date, feeling insecure, you've brought along a set of index cards. You know, 7 p.m. inquire Ari childhood memories, 7.15 p.m. praise her outfit. We really want the date to go well. But every time we glance down at our index cards, this is felt by our date as disengagement. And she's right, we're leaving her out of the process. Our anxiety has made us crave a method when what the situation demanded was some moment to moment responsiveness to what was actually happening, to the true energy of the conversation. We prepare those cards and bring them along and keep awkwardly consulting them when we should be looking deeply into our date's eyes. Because, we're, because we don't believe that devoid of a plan, we have enough to offer. Some conversations feel evasive, ill-considered, agenda-laced, selfish. Others feel intense, urgent, generous, truthful. What's the difference? Well, I'd say it's presence. Are we there or not? Is the person across the table there to us or not? There's something about this. I, I have so many different... Um, bodily like felt responses to what we bring together and there always something happens but what I'm noticing in me is this kind of Lizzie is this kind of profound joy and impish playfulness that comes from reading George Saunders words they're so wonderfully um loving uh of us complicated humans and and the thing I love a sort of feeling most touched by as you were reading is how badly our conversations often go precisely because we want them to go really well like the really tender heartfelt good intention that we have that i want this to be okay i want you to like me i want to like you i want to be happy in your presence i want this to be interesting i want you know i want something to happen i want you to understand something i want to exp express how i'm feeling so often and it's not that we all always have good intentions in our conversations we might want to dominate the other person or shut them out or be powerful over them or you know something but but even when we really care about how this goes and how it might be for the other person even then uh, it's so easy for a conversation to be anything other than that mm. so I think that's really I find that really helpful to, <laughs> to remember because you know so many times when I've been in a situation, I, I often find it, there's a sort of parallel for me with this in, um, it's easier for me with this with one-on-one -on -one being here with you to really pay attention. But if I'm with a group or speaking with a group or something, sometimes I can feel this dynamic come forward much more strongly and I get to the end of a thing and I'm filled with shame and self-criticism about all the ways in which that didn't go well and I wasn't in contact and all of that. And it's so helpful to start with and all of that is because I really wanted it to go well. That really is the truth. I really wanted this to go well and to meet people and to be met. And I think, as always, George Saunders is onto something so um, brilliantly, straightforwardly true, which is the trouble starts with all of our attempts because we want it to go well. And when we feel inadequate to the situation like we can't imagine that I I can't imagine that I would be the one who would be able to respond to whatever's here that then what we want to do is to grasp hold of it and to you know really make it go a particular way and the index cards is so close to actually what 
you know what this is like and it may not be actual physical ones but there might be ones in my mind and i'm trying to work out if i say this and maybe if i've prepared this and and it's really sweet <laughs> you know to to know that the combination of our own wish to have it go a particular way which may or may not actually be the right way for what's here or for the person who's here but it's a good intent and our fear about our own capacity sort of add up to us trying to keep control and then once we once we try to take control uh, whilst we're doing that everything that we've longed for is off the is off the table because I'm no longer a person I'm a someone trying to reach a goal and you you for sure are not a person really at that point because I'm trying to get you to feel a particular way or to think a particular way or to meet me in a particular way or whatever it is and I wonder I know that what we've been doing for six five and a bit years into our sixth is every week is practicing starting with something and then letting everything all of our attempts to have it be something in particular fall away so we can meet one another. It's really touching that in a way it's also so simple that in a way what we're here to do, what we're most able to do is to respond to the aliveness of something and be improvised together and wonder together and discover together. Anyway, all of that. Oh my gosh, as usual. So <clears throat> the interesting thing about not being on autopilot, like I'm not on autopilot now, is that there's so much response. Like how do you how does one select the thing to bring forth? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I'm noticing, Justin, is how, you know, you said impish playfulness at the beginning of what you were saying just then. And I noticed that there's a kind of excitement in me that exists in the kind of conversation that you're talking about where both people are present and we, and we don't know how it's going to unfold. Like I can feel how compelling that is for me to be there. And I know what happens to me when I'm with others who are on autopilot, which is that I also go on autopilot. Cause I think, Oh, I was in a thing the other day and somebody was like quite hilariously not listening to me. Like whatever I said, she just spoke over me and then didn't even reference the thing I'd said. And I thought, I don't think there's any point in me being here because this isn't going anywhere. And it was just really useless. You know what I mean? Like I was like, there's no point in this conversation anymore. So I'd, just going to say thank you very much and get through the rest of it or whatever but it had a really big impact on me that this person was just trying to get through her agenda and I I apparently wasn't there like I could feel that I wasn't there so I'm really interested in this having been the person who's been autopiloted to feel the impact on me so that I can understand that if I'm ever like that with people that's what it might be like for them and when we talk about two people being present and open and wondering together, I can feel all the life kind of rush back into me and all of the hope and all of the wondering and all of the curiosity and all of the, what on earth is going to happen here? And it, of course, there's a reason, probably a reason to meet, you know, there's a, there's a, this is a reason to meet. We've shown up here with a, with a source and a plan and in terms of timing and when we're going to do it and how we're going to do it. But inside of that, there's no agenda. There's no, this needs to go a certain way. We need to come up with three salient points that will help people or something. There's nothing like that. And so then it feels quite beautifully kind of on the edge of glory. You know, what, what, what might emerge? And actually, Justin, I've been really moved in the last couple of months of conversations where it hasn't been possible to have an agenda because what's happening is pretty complex and difficult and com filled with conflict. And all I've really had to rely on is this. And thank God I have it, you know, thank God I know how to be here with you and do this. This has been such a beautiful ongoing training for me because it gives me the faith and courage 
even when I'm not with you, with but with others too, to say, well, we're going to we're going to talk. We're going to say some words and we're going to give each other space and we're going to really listen and we're going to be present. And then we're going to see, like, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe it will resolve itself. Maybe it won't. Maybe goodness knows what's going to happen, but we're going to begin. And I've got faith just to begin. And it's been such a gift to be able to do that. And really quite miraculously, each time I bring that way of wandering in, to something difficult or something contentious with those boundaries of listening to one another, something really, truly miraculous happens. I think there's been about three times in the last month where I've thought, oh, this is hairy. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how to do this. I feel well out of my depth because it's so complex and everyone's right. You know, there's situations where everybody's right. There's nobody who's wrong. There's nobody doing anything untoward. It's, it's all, everyone's right, and yet it's difficult. <laughs> Those situations, turning up with this, has completely turned things around in a way that before I got into the conversation, I thought, oh no, this is going to be horribly, this is going to go horribly wrong. And, you know, had all this fear and all this, um, like an agenda of fear in a way. And of course, the situation demanded that I put that to the side and did this thing, which is, I'm going to be present. We're going to talk and see what happens. And then, as you said, it's so simple. And yet really significant things happen from it, which if we'd have tried to sort it out or to declare rightness and wrongness or bring any black and whiteness or try and move forward in some way before we were ready, none, nothing could have happened in the way that it did. So I feel very moved by the miraculousness of this and what's possible from it. Hmm. In um, the first things you said just now was um, one of the things about being in conversation in this way is that if you're, if we're really allowing ourselves to be present, to be here, be people with one another, so much arises and there's so many different things we could say and so many different ways that we could go and there's no way of knowing which way to go and I was so so touched by that because it in in both the situations that you're talking about and some of some of those situations we've been in together over recent months and some of them I've been in you know where, where there's something complicated and everyone's right no one's wrong and you're trying to see what's here and all of that or um I'm thinking about um coaching people just being with 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 some other person I, I can so feel in myself that one of you know one of the forms of getting stuck is is the kind that George Saunders is most like strongly talking about which is I really want it to go well and I don't trust myself to, to have it go well so I'm going to grasp onto it but the other the other sort of related version of it is I suppose it's really the same thing is um I really want a very particular thing to happen here and the, the moment the moment we get into that, into trying to force a very particular thing to happen, it seems to me it's the easiest thing for us to do is to disappear from my own presence and into a kind of inner, I know in my own body, I, if I pay attention, it's not so hard to tell that that's what's going on for me. I've clenched up or I've zoned out so, so I don't feel something I don't want to feel or, or something. And um, very often, even in the sort of the most generous of circumstances, like, like coaching someone and supporting somebody else, in the, in the face of there being who knows how many different things I could say or respond to at that moment, the thing that kills the conversation every time is my trying to figure out which one is the right one. Yeah. You know, like I've got to get the right one. And then I've gone, I'm, I'm gone at that point. Or, and, and um, it really struck me that that's the same. So it's, I've been really consciously practicing in my work, continually softening to the, to the mystery. Like we just don't know. We really, and you said, I think I was really struck by what you said that so often in a conversation, we do have an overarching, there's an overarching intention. We won't think, you know, like when you're gathering people together and it's difficult, we would want things to be better or to be resolved or to heal something or to understand something or, 
I want this person that I'm working with to flourish in some way or so that our ability, our sort of really deeply human ability, sort of sense of having an overarching something that matters to us seems really important here. It, it matters that that's the case. And then within the conversation, what really matters is letting go of everything, trusting, being faithful to the sort of the presence of the overall intention and then and then letting ourselves go into the complete mystery of what might happen. And we can have processes and structures to help us do that. Like we're practicing one of those now, which is we we have this unhurried conversation, you and I, and we wait until one of us is finished and then give space for the next, for you, I finish, and then you get to speak until you're done. And so there are practices that can support us, but in the end, all, what, what all of those add up to or make possible is the willingness, if we'll have it, to let ourselves go into the unknown, to be faithful to something, to be faithful to, if I can be faithful to my capacity and I can be faithful to your capacity, we can also be in something really hard where mm. things are difficult and we feel like things are going wrong and it's not that you're wrong and I'm right or I'm right, you're wrong, or we even really know what's going on, which mm. is the kind of thing you were talking about. Yeah when we have to set aside all of our agenda, agendas and all of our ideas about how this might turn out and trust that there's um, a sort of an intelligence and a care and a good heartedness in the field between us that's not just in you and it's not just in me and it's, it's on the in-between and it was always there before we stepped into the conversation. We have to find a way to be faithful to that and to not kill it by contracting away from it. And um, years ago, I learned from wonderful organization develop, um, development uh, person, uh, Patricia Shaw, whose work I love. I was in a session with her and she said, um, very often, particularly in workplaces, but not just there, you know, whenever we're up to something important, the conversation dies, but nobody, nobody remarks on the conversation having died. We don't pay attention to it and we go, we keep going as if it was still alive and it died like five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago or two hours ago. Yeah. But nobody right. said, mm. Oh, look, look, feel that's look what's going on here. And that's when we um, stop being faithful to the possibility seems to me when we, so there's something so that I'm getting from what you're saying sort of coming up in, in me is this, um, the inherent hopefulness of what, what can be when we allow ourselves to really trust what it is to be present with one, present and open and ungrasping, that we really can be faithful to something here that is filled with possibilities for mm -hmm. healing and understanding and sometimes resolution and sometimes action that we might take on all kinds of things. Yeah. Well, as, as as usual, Justin, something's here that is slightly out of my view, but I'm going to try and find some words. But as you were talking, I was thinking if I, if I'm not trusting and if I'm not having faith, who am I taking myself to be in that moment of steering something or controlling something or wanting a certain agenda? And somehow I can see what a mistake it is to not ask myself that question when I'm fearful and wanting something. It's so easy to get taken by that, you know, it's so easy to just think that I'm right by having an agenda or I'm right by needing it to go a certain way. But then when I find this, well, who, who, who do I think I'm being? Who am I taking myself to be if I feel like I'm even in control of this? Like, am I the Am I the arbiter of truth? Am I the most powerful person in the room? Like the answer to those things is just always no. So it's it's a funny dance, isn't it? It feels a little bit like turning up like that is quite profoundly kind of inappropriate given the nature of humanness. You know, that we all have the same capacity to speak and to see and to feel into the world from very different places. Why would one thing be more 
valid than another like in in the arising whatever is between us or in a bigger group I feel like we could listen to everything everything could be welcome really everything even the things that aren't supposed to be welcome you know you mentioned dominating a conversation earlier that that doesn't need to be a threat. You know, we, we can, there's something about the practice, Justin, of listening to other in this way, one another in this way that you're talking about where we speak and then let somebody else speak and or listen when someone else is speaking, you know, that practice. Where somehow I'm seeing the power of it is that it kind of allows what's here to be here rather than this weird thing we get into where we're not allowing certain things to be here, but there is, they're still here. We're just pretending they're not by silencing them or something, but they're still here. So whatever's in a room is in, is in a room as it were, even if it's a virtual room. And we could seek to see what's really here, or we could seek to edit it to the point where it meets my, serves me or something much smaller than what's here. And it's brave work to serve what's here because it's kind of uncontrollable. And of course, as beings, we've spoken about it so many times, like our desire is to fix things and to control things and have things small and manageable and doable. And so it feels like, yes, it's really brave work, but all we're really doing is admitting what's already here. It's not like we're creating a beast by opening the doors or something. It's already here. People are already in their experience. So how do we... How do we be kind of big enough to understand that already when we step in and be ready for it, be ready for the everythingness, be ready for the, the complex nature of humanness rather than going in with the kind of uh, like a knife. I'm going to cut that bit off and cut that bit off so then we can manage with this bit. And, you know, I'm particularly talking about complex human processes that have difficulty and wounds and goodness knows what in them but I'm really struck by the kind of if I think it's my job to cut something down to size so it's manageable for me what am I even in service to what am I answering the call for by doing that and I'm pretty sure it's just something to do with my fear and my wish to have things be small rather than big that's um, such a powerful question to ask ourselves. I was so struck by what you said that if we can ask, I'm going to, to do this, you know, wonder who am I trying to be here? Who am I taking myself to be? Am, am I trying to be the arbiter of truth or the one who knows how this should go? Or such a excellent question for so many situations. Or am I being the one who's here to be present and to discover and to make contact and relationship with you mm. to find out what might be and to trust my wisdom and good heart and depth and breadth and you all wisdom, good heart and depth and breadth and discover something together. Mm. And it, it also, it also strikes me in what you were just saying that um, it's also the case that very many things change by our being in conversation with one another. So like I was thinking about all the times mm. I've gone into a situation with somebody else or some other people and there's been where there's been difficulty, sort of a different situation from the, the date that George Saunders is imagining where we're trying to just discover what's glorious about one another and, you know, all of that. And I've gone in, I've begun with a sense of, um, I already know what, what you think and feel and what you want and I don't like it and I don't want to feel certain things in me and I don't want to hear certain things from you. And because of all of that, I'm then going to be the one, who, like you said, I'm going to try to be the one who's in, who like somehow in charge of the conversation or most right or sets the bounds of what can be brought, all of that. And like you said, and everything I'm trying not to have here is here anyway. So maybe we could find a way to bring it as it, you know, I don't mean, I don't mean bringing everything that's in my mind, like just, bleh, but sort of giving it space and 
but also once we do that it changes gosh how many times I've mm. begun a conversation where I thought that this was um my job was to defend to defend myself against the possibility that I might be wrong and it's turned out that what the conversation is is a way of meeting one another in our confusedness and our hurt and our wish for things to be better and then the the being wrong and being right that I thought was the thing that, that felt to me like the thing that was most present and all of my fear around it changes into something else by being in the conversation and often by saying I'm frightened about this conversation because I'm I'm feeling really tender and defensive and worried and so very little in the in-between us is is completely fixed and that's what bringing our presence is and the moment the moment I take on the roles that you were pointing out the moment I try to be the one who's right I also make you into it that's the point at which I, I love George Saunders's line is the other person there to us or not yeah because you stop being a person at that point you you become someone for me to defeat or someone for me to defend myself against or someone who's a threat or and you could like all of those can be part of the truth but they're they're never the whole truth of you as a person mm. so I'm really sort of left by what you're saying really um interested in and awakened to this question about how what it is to really be faithful to okay I'm going to be a person in all of my depth and complexity and everything I'm feeling here and I'm going to trust you to be a person and I'm going to do my best to stay a person and to have you be a person to me all the way through and then trust that our being together in our conversation something can be born it may not be what I want it may not be what I've imagined it but something real can come from our being with one another that way and it might be that we find that we deeply love one another or it might be that we find that we understand we understand one another in new ways or something gets healed also justin strikes me that we never planned to have this way of listening to one another like we didn't have the distinctions around this five years ago or whatever at hand to say right this is how we're going to do this you talk and then I listen. And then when you when I sense that you've finished, I'm going to start talking again. And so that got born just between us. And of course, there's people who articulate that as a method and all of that kind of thing. But I feel quite glad that we didn't have to have that method established, if you know what I mean. It, it, it was what this was already. It was the most appropriate way that we could think of of being in these conversations together was to listen to one another fully and then see what arose. And no matter how long ago it was that we started this, that the miraculousness of the way we began doesn't ever fail to miraculize me. You know, I always think we just got into this and, and started in this way that has served us. And it's still the same thing. You know, a little structure that gives this much miraculizes me. I just think it's so cool. And I'm so impressed by it and so met by it and interested and ready and alive to just being in the conversation about these wonderful things. And of course, the source really matters, doesn't it? And you and I have a sense of what is between us and what our work really is and plenty of sources probably many things we read don't make it here if you know what I mean <laughs> many things I read don't make it here and many things do but more things don't than do so it is also a a, a process of I don't know what's the word procurement or something like being conscious about what gets to come here as well that that is of the same nature of the way that we want to speak to one another but I'm just yeah just feeling in amazement of the of the practice itself and the rhythm that we have and the, the small structure that it is and what it has something so small and simple can give so much a lovely place to end with um a sense of this sort of threefold the structure really helps having structures really help you know appropriate ones that guide us whether it's the form of a date or the form of a this or the form of a coaching conversation or something. 
and uh, choosing our starting place really helps. Not being sloppy or slapdash about it, like having proper good intention, which I think is what choosing sources is, is having, bringing ourselves with care to the good intention that seeds it. And then, um, and then inside of all of that, letting ourselves fall into the riskiness and the edginess and the aliveness and the delight and joy and the, all of it of um, being present and being people to one another, trusting, trusting then what's on the in-between. That's what this, um, this conversation is. It's a great, great blessing to be part of it with you, Lizzie, and to be met in this way. You, you uh, keep on reminding me what it is to be a person and to, to be whole and to be here. Thank you for that. Thank you everyone for being with us, all the, all the people that we can't see, Lizzie, but who we know are here around us. And um, thank you all of you for being with us. And please feel very welcome to tell other people about these conversations. If you think that they would benefit from them, you can send them links to the podcast or our website or YouTube or direct them to our Facebook group, Turning Towards Life. And you can email us Lizzie or Justin or just hello at turning towards dot life. We'd love to hear from you and all being well, we will be back same time next week. Bye bye. Hey everybody. Everyone. Bye.